Hello. This year was the last hurrah for Hammer in terms of its horror output. The familiar, the experimental, and a brief nod towards Giallo were released to mix successes and appreciation. Despite many a brainstorm from new directors, writers, and a different viewpoint to chime with the new decade, the think tank was beginning to run out of ideas. Sir James Carreras struck a short-lived deal with Warner Brothers, but the well was distinctly running dry in terms of financial backing. Independent horror, especially stateside, flooded the cinema and pushed the extreme a little further as the bell-bottomed age took a nihilistic sneer at life and its meaning in general, especially now realising that the American dream had died. A new dawn had surfaced, including rivals to the Hammer Studios in the UK, companies such as Tygon Films, also with an advantage over Hammer of distributing foreign movies for UK release, and of course those superb anthology series from Amicus. And it seemed, despite valiant efforts, Hammer Films were beginning to seem rather old-fashioned and where they were the inspiration and set themselves a bar above the others, they now found they were on a level playing field at best, and in worst case scenario, the studios they inspired sometimes did a better job. Let's look, look, and look again at the films that were part of the beginning of the end, shall we? There's no one here. going on? In the Serbian village of Shetl, Count Mitterhaus is staked by the angry yokels. However, 15 years after the event, the village finds itself not in the grip of a vampire tyrant, but that of a mysterious plague. The village doctor, Kirsch, and his son Anton dodge the soldiers guarding the perimeter of the village that keep the infected from leaving. Both risk their lives to ferry drugs to aid the sick from one village to another. On returning to Shettel, both the doctor and his son witness the arrival of a circus called the Circus of Knights. The enlightenment is short-lived, though, as with a band of gypsies comes a darker side when locals are found drained of blood. The circus is indeed a front for a colony of animal shape-shifting vampires, the clique is led by Emil, a cousin of Mitterhouse, and a mysterious gypsy woman. They have come to Shettel to fulfil the Count's last words, an evil, vicious curse of death and destruction on those who participated in his impaling. The children of Shettel become the targets for a brutal and devastating revenge as the Vampire Circus rehearses for its most deadly performance.
For the film Vampire Circus, the sets of The Twins of Evil were used. Robert Young made his directorial debut with the film, his first and last for Hammer, until the TV series with the superb episode of Hammer House of Horror, Charlie Boy. Young unfortunately let the budget for the film spiral out of control, and entire scenes had to be sacrificed, so the vampire circus we see now is never going to be the full version as a young intended. For the part of Emile, it was going to be David Essex. However, actor Anthony Corlin, who'd already cropped up in Taste the Blood of Dracula, pipped Essex to the post. Corlin eventually changed his surname to Higgins and appeared in a wealth of television and film projects, including mainstream art house fare such as the Draftsman's Contract. Anthony Corlin used his name for the last time in the role of Ahmed in another art house piece of nunsploitation called Flavia the Heretic two years later, a worthwhile watch if you get the chance. In her first big screen debut, we also see Lala Ward as part of a shape-shifting vampire bat double act. Her name's Helga in this. Ironically, Ward loathed act. However, her skills were not necessary. Ward recalls, After five weeks of shooting I made a special journey back. Lala returned to her school to tell her teacher that we didn't have to go to his silly classes. All I had to do was jump off two silly boxes and then look at the camera, out of breath. He was furious with me. Lala Ward went on to appear in TV gold such as the Duchess of Duke Street and of course Doctor Who as Princess Astra in the first instance, and then as a freshly regenerated Romana. Lala Ward, Adrienne Corrie as a gypsy woman, and Lawrence Payne, who played Doctor Kirsch from this film, would also be re reunited again on the Doctor Who story The Leisure Hive eight years later. A genuine church organ was used for David Whittaker's eerie score. Whittaker apparently hired the church and recorded his sound there, on the premises to now the ambience of the soundtrack he so desperately wanted to realise. Mary Chipperfield provided the animals, let's hope they fared better in their treatment in front of the lens than the treatment of them behind it. Vampire Circus ran foul of the censors with John Trevelyan gone and the more strict Stephen Murphy appointed as head hatchet man for all things celluloid. Murphy informed Hammer that if shot, as the script intended, then 50% of the film would end up on the cutting room floor. Hammer obliged, mainly to appease the strict sensorial stance, and dropped a few scenes due to the high costs. However, once it was in the can and shipped to the USA, the Motion Picture of America Association demanded three minutes of footage to be excised before it's released. The Daily Mirror sensationally noted in one review at the time, Hammer Films have rediscovered their jolly horror touch with Vampire Circus X New Victoria. If you like scenes dripping with blood, mutilated corpses, screeching bats and things that creep around the crypt, then here is a macabre morsel to sink your teeth into. As for Adrienne Corey, she can bite my neck any day. Vampire Circus currently has no UK release in high definition, now there's a surprise. However, the boys and girls at Synapse have given us a real treat with a Blu-ray DVD combo of the film with a bevy of extras. Not to be overlooked though is the German release by Anolis with a host of extras, as well as releasing the film in a limited range of media books featuring three different cover arts. <laughs> Vampire Circus is highly watchable, from the brutal opening sequence, a dangerous combination of eroticism and uh, violence, to the denouement, some of which takes place in an exquisite Ottoman chapel, as well as the cobwebby catacombs. This is Hammer's reaction to the more explicit material coming from Europe at the time and stateside, also to court controversy is the subtle hint throughout of pederasty. Robert Young presents us with a colourful but quirky canvas of decay and corruption of innocence, 
as well as a few surprises too. I love the bat and the skull scene, for example. Adrian Corey attacks the part with relishness as a standout villainess, and Corlin, as the feral Emile, is definitely not placed in the shade because of her. The only part of the film I found to be more horrendous than the fanged shenanigans is the contribution of 18-year-old actor John Mulder Brown in the part of Anton, whose line delivery gave me more shudders than any horrible transgressions the Carnies could ever inflict on their human targets. Perhaps he was dubbed. Brown was chosen by director Young after spotting him in the 1970 drama Deep End, the movie where we get to see Jane Asher in the all together. Mulder Brown did not give up his day job though and still dabbled with TV and film right up until 2014. I remember him best for his role as the creepy adolescent Louis in 1969's The House That Screamed, a definite must-see if you get the chance. Despite the fairy tale feel and childlike veil of circuses and giddy youth, Vampire Circus also bleeds a dank, depressive drip of misery for a village cut off from the world avoiding plague, only to be penetrated by a fate much worse, which all links up at the end. A little bit excitable at times, as well as being a touch haphazard, no doubt due to the abandoned scenes, Vampire Circus Whip Cracks in at 8 out of 10. Eighteen seventy two, Hyde Park in London, and Lawrence Van Helsing engages in battle with a sworn enemy, none other than Count, Count Dracula. Dracula. The evil Count is staked by a spoke from a carriage wheel. The Count is reduced to ashes, and Van Helsing also perishes in the skirmish. The Count's ashes are collected in a file by a mysterious young man who takes time to admire the Count's ring piece as well, before slipping it on his nimble digit. He takes the ashes, and as Lawrence Van Helsing is buried, he does the same to the file in unhallowed ground. One hundred years later, in Wingding Chelsea, Johnny Alucard persuades his young friends to take the ultimate trip, a black mass in a desecrated church. One of the attendees is Jessica Van Helsing, Lorimer Van Helsing's granddaughter. Jessica and her boyfriend are shocked to find her great-grandfather's grave at the desolate church. Jessica's friend Laura, a game bird, agrees to a baptism of blood. Alucard oversees a ceremony and follows the instructions to the last letter. The dark forces are finally unleashed and Dracula's ashes are stimulated into action again after Alucard uses his blood to infuse with that of the Count and provides enough raw energy to revive him. Dracula is revived and is impassioned to seek revenge on Lorimer Van Helsing's descendants for what they did a century before, his eye firmly on Jessica. Lorimer Van Helsing and the younger set need to battle the Count and ensure they rid themselves of the notorious vampire stranglehold and prevent him bringing down the house of the Van Helsing family. Dracula 
Director Alan Gibson, already known to the Hammer family for his direction on the film Crescendo, was put behind the camera with a budget of £200,000, which is about £2.3 in today's money. Dracula AD 1972 sported a screenplay penned by Don Hofton, and initially was known as Dracula Chases the Mini Girls during production, then Dracula Today and Dracula Chelsea 72. The titles changed for the Spanish and French markets, where it was known as Dracula 73 due to its release there one year after its UK and USA debut. Dracula AD 1972 is the part of a double bill of sorts with Satanic Rites of Dracula that followed a year later as both feature the same director and characters, including Inspector Coles who appear in both films as Coles kind of plays Watson to Van Helsing's Sherlock. It's a prize example of the studio's demonstration of updating an old theme and featuring it in the present day, where it would now stay and carry on again in Alan Gibson's companion piece. But more of that later. Another influence was the success of the Count Yorga films, also set in contemporary times, which proved immensely popular. Christopher Lee was dissatisfied with his role, now appearing more out of respect than anything else. Lee said, All I get to do is stand around, on unhallowed ground, sweep down corridors, and make the odd pounce or two. Lee, however, did manage to persuade the production to insert a line straight out of Stoker's book. You would play your brains against mine, against me who has commanded nations. Caroline Monroe, already seen in a nationwide publicity campaign for Lamb's Navy Rum, plays the victim perfectly in her first Hammer feature and goes on to play a lead part in her second Hammer outing, so you check out the next programme for that. The beautiful Stephanie Beecham seems slightly out of place and even at 25 years seems too mature for the part. Come to think of it, most of the younger set do. Another familiar face was that of Marsha Hunt, known for dating Jimi Hendrix and being used as cockney rhyming slang for something that's unique to women. Hunt was rather perturbed by the black mass segment by all accounts and genuinely believed if they had carried on they would have indeed summoned up the Horned One. Producer Josephine Douglas was called upon to calm her down after Hunt's borderline hysterics. As well as the first interracial nibble, the crafty old Count had his first sip of male blood from acolyte Christopher Neem, where, reportedly, Lee actually managed to draw blood, although in the version we see, the screen cuts short before the man-on-man neckpeck. Dracula AD 1972 gets a bare bones release stateside by Warner Brothers Archive, but this is sadly pretty bare boned. The release in the UK is um, just as good in terms of the high definition print, but also just features the measly theatrical trailer and uh, is very Spartan on the extras. It's a shame Synapse or Shout Factory weren't given the distribution thumbs up. <laughs> Often derided by fans and critics alike, Dracula AD 1972 has had a particularly rough ride. So much a product of its time, but you know what? I found it to be viewed better nowadays for its truly nostalgic appeal. The only odd thing is that even when it was released in 1972, it may well have come across all rather dated. We're presented with the youth culture at the time being viewed from the eyes of the middle-aged, who obviously had lost touch with the current scene. Hufton's screenplay has his youth getting high on caffeine most of the time, although somewhere in the duration it dares to mention the drug culture, and during the ritual a spliff can be seen being passed around, as well as Marsha Hunt getting stoned before she makes out with Johnny Alucard. Hufton's youth come over all unnecessary at the thought of going to a jazz spectacular and say some one-liners you'd have probably heard a few years earlier in the mid to late 1960s. It all seems slightly out of place, especially when you look at the horror genre emerging from Europe and stateside. It's quite comical, but strangely endearing. Dracula AD 1972 is definitely Scooby-Doo meets Stoker. I would have loved a count to have uttered at his demise. I would have got away with it if it wasn't for those pesky kids. 
There are some solid performances by all, especially Neem as Johnny Alucard, although he veers into scenery chewing on occasion. Shame he wasn't used more, to be honest, but I guess Shane Bryant uh, usurped him, seemingly. Neem does manage gravitas and menace, and his performances go is up there with Ralph Bates. Fortunately, Neem went on to a wealth of TV and film performances, some of which were pure cult. Alucard's character can clearly be shadowed in Neem's interpretation of Skagra in the shelved Doctor Who story Sharda nine years later. I can see why it wasn't a palpable hit at the time, as it's neither trendy or hip enough for the market it preaches to, and alas not familiar and safe enough for the loyal fans the Hammer Studios had wooed back in their glory days. It was also seemingly marketed as a spoof, despite director Gibson playing it straight. The theme of youth versus the older generation can clearly be evident in the opening party scene, already tried and tested and taste the blood of Dracula, and an attempt at showcasing class division, although let's face it, the youth here seem all too middle class as well, flirting with uh, being part of the Age of Aquarius rather than truly swallowing the whole philosophy. Gibson also provides a few nods to the out with the old and in with the new concept, the decrepit church in the process of being bulldozed for a modern office complex being one of the few statements concerning change, the other is a blatant disregard in chronology and a total disassociation of the six previous Dracula outings. The soundtrack was originally going to feature Rod Stewart's band The Faces, but this went pear-shaped and it went to Manfred Mann's guitarist Michael Vickers to provide the groove. The faces were mooted as appearing, but I guess they were replaced by the group Stone Ground. This ensures the influence of the classical composer is done and dusted by the time we are transported to 1972 in an opening sequence which is quite high octane and jarringly done. I must admit I loved the switch from the Victorian age to the second Elizabethan age with a simple skyward sweep and perfectly captured aeroplane. Gibson's direction presents some lovely touches, especially the use of light and the key tone of purple. There really are some smashing touches here, the black mass being one, and also when Jessica Van Helsing finds she is in the company of two ravenous vampires at the local discotheque being another. Marsha Hunt being drained of blood and becoming paler is also eye-rollingly amusing, although some woke pricks would probably list this as a visual hate crime. Finally, since 1958, it's great to see the original pairing of Cushing and Lee, and the reward is without a doubt watching them battle it out again, especially at the beginning and at the end. Alan Gibson has created something of an oddity, much more comic strip in its gaudiness, and there's some smashing bits of atmosphere, though it somehow feels a lightly tremored production overall. Dracula AD 1972 could also almost give um, a lust for a vampire a run for its money in the cheesy stakes, and it really has as much in connection with the zeitgeist of the bell-bottom aged as Paisley, Flower Power and a Carnaby Street mentality. Despite this, it gets an 8 from me, purely for its time capsule appeal, and wrapped up any way you like, Dracula AD 1972 is bloody good fun and engaging hooey. Will I watch and enjoy it again in years to come? Most definitely. She is not the one. You have not learnt to obey. She is not the one. But Master, you promised me. I promised you nothing. I'll get her. Johnny. I swear I'll get her. Oh, God, Johnny, no. The other hammers this year were more attempts at realising the small screen sitcom to the big screen. 
nearest and dearest, a popular sitcom at the time revolving around the antics of brother and sister of a pickle factory, namely Nellie and Eli Pledge, played by feisty munchkin Hilda Baker and Jimmy Jewell, who has such a lived-in face it probably has squatters. Nearest and dearest, however, was not the smash that Hammer had hoped for. It's okay, but side-splitting if we compare what is comedy today, most of which is about as funny as a fire in an orphanage. What fared better for Hammer, though, was a follow-up to the smash hit they had previously, with more antics on the buses. In Mutiny on the Buses, the main lead Stan's layabout brother Arthur gets a bus driver's job with the usual farces that result, including getting diverted and stranding at a zoo. The short-lived BBC sitcom That's Your Funeral, made in 1970, got the celluloid treatment where the antics of undertakers are played for laughs as two sparring firms get involved in drug trafficking with hearses full of illegal booty. This also was a disappointment at the box office, possibly due to the sitcom being screened two years prior, comprising just the one season of six episodes. One thing interesting to note is during the opening credits, the actors at the funeral, paying their respects, are the production crew. Here we get to see, albeit briefly, the men and women who were involved with Hammer at the time. We know who they are as they appear alongside their name. Nice touch, I thought. On a more darkened note, Hammer attempted two thrillers harking back to the psychological thrillers they did in the 60s, one we will look at in uh, more detail shortly, but the other, due to feature on a double bill with Straight On Till Morning, called Women in Terror, was a film called Fear in the Night. In the film, Judy Geeson, a teacher's wife, is recovering at a boys' school from an assault. However, she begins to slip into delirium again, as the assailant seemingly has followed her, and the nightmare continues. But is there something else afoot? An admirable stab at the thriller cycle, which is mildly giallo-esque, although you can spot things a mile off before the big reveal. This was Ralph Bates' last film for Hammer. Bates sadly died of cancer in 1991. The movie also stars Joan Collins, who was reportedly a diva on set, clashing with director Jimmy Sangster more times than enough. Cushing is chilling here, adding an extra layer to the film's autumnal feel. A village community in Bavaria is rocked to its provincial knees when there is a spate of local girls going missing. This generates a fever pitch of paranoia and fear in the small community. The villagers believe it is a work of a demon from the surrounding woodland. Count Zorn, who resides in a nearby castle, keeps his son and daughter in total isolation from the outside world. Zorn believes he is shielding them from a hereditary family curse of madness and preventing further incestuous desire. Zorn is obsessed with a cure. A mesmerist is appointed by Zorn, who delves deep into the family's pasts and reveals its dark secrets. However, what is brought to the surface about the demons that strike are those demons that live in the darkest recesses of the human psyche and ones that torment a damaged brain. Australian director Peter Sykes has already dabbled with the horror genre in 1971's Venom. Of this Sykes' second horror, this time gothic psychodrama, Sykes said, It gets at the grassroots of the basis of life, the fear of the dark and of death. Everyone is basically scared of the same things. Demons of the Mind was previously known as Blood Evil and Blood Will Have Blood. Initially, the family curse was that of lycanthropy until screenwriter Christopher Wicking got hold of the script and the final product, bar a few dialogue scenes, only echoes what was before. Wicking said, That picture was developed parallel to blood from the mummy's tomb. We tried to see if we could, 
invent something new. So, we took the idea of early attempts to try, and understand the human mind, coupled, with the werewolf legend. Again, the picture, turned out quite different from how, we conceived it. The production brought together a prestigious group of thespian talents, Michael Horden playing the deranged priest, Robert Hardy playing Zorn, Yvonne Mitchell playing Aunt Hilda, and Patrick McGee playing a mesmerist called Falkenberg. Alongside the established, we had the younger talents of Shane Bryant as Emile in his first cinematic outing for Hammer, and Gillian Hills as his sister Elizabeth. Hills could be seen three years earlier in the TV series The Owl Service. Check out my review of The Owl Service way back in season two. The pop group Manfred Mann's lead singer and harmonica player Paul Jones makes a third cinematic outing, possibly selected by Sykes due to working with him on the 1968 film The Committee. Jones' first role was in the psychedelic comedy drama Privilege in 1967. It was claimed some scenes, according to the press notes, were shot in Bavaria, which was a phony claim, as all was shot in and around Wykehurst, Sussex. Designer Michael Stringer part created Castle Zorn, the original turreted Sussex Folly, was built by architect August Pugin in the late 1790s. Michael Stringer added the stained glass windows in the stairwell and hallways to give it another gothic layer. Robert Hardy Zorn was first considered for actor Paul Schofield and then James Mason, but they both sniffed at the offer. Marianne Faithful was to have been considered for the role of Elizabeth, but Gillian Hills was used instead. The film was eventually released as classed as a disappointment at the time, as second fiddle to the trashy but unwatchable Tower of Evil, and was held back in release for well over a year. Patrick McGee's character of Falkenberg, assigned to rid the demons of the mind, was based on Austrian Franz Mesmer, whose technique of unleashing animalistic forces in us by hypnosis became a scientific trend, but alas was vilified as a radical. Demons of the Mind. Demons of the Mind gets a superb release on the uh, Shout Factory label. Based on the commentaries and the extras for this US release, other releases in high definition in Germany and the United Kingdom are very poor relations indeed. This is most certainly the one to go for. God bless America. Loosely based on the fall of the House of Usher, Demons of the Mind is one of the most unique of the Hammer cycle of movies, proving even at this stage Hammer were still trying to present a refreshing unusual for the cinema goer. Demons of the Mind is a highly intelligent film in my opinion, looking at four levels of science and belief, the clash between the old order taking over the new, the superstition replaced by the emergence of science from the base pagan traditions represented by the villagers, in which a glorious example of bucolic rites are presented. Then we move to the medieval form of leeching, except a mechanical way of doing this in the form of cupping and using a scarifier to purge the blood and bleed away the dodgy humours which takes place in the Zorn household. Then, up until the current time, with mesmerism playing a vital part in a cure for madness is demonstrated by the maverick Falkenberg. And finally, the modern approach represented in Paul Jones' character of Carl Richter. To understand the film and be satisfied with the viewing experience, a little knowledge is needed. You see, modern hypnosis had its beginnings in the uncommon practices of Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer, a physician who lived in Vienna, Austria, during the mid-18th century. Where do you think you get mesmerised from? 
Mesmer was a zealous believer in the more mystical facets of Western medical culture, including the authority of astronomy and magnets on human well-being. In 1774, during magnetic therapy of a female patient, Mesmer felt that he witnessed a fluid flowing through the woman's body. This flow was manipulated and affected by his own will. He eventually named this fluid and its manipulation and called it animal magnetism and developed a fancy rationale concerning its consequence on health. Mesmer believed that every individual had magnetic fluid streaming through channels throughout their body and that barriers in the cascade of this fluid caused physical or mental disease. He believed that certain individuals had more or less instinctual animal magnetism and this was mixed in their capability to influence the flow of this fluid. Sykes presents it here with the control of Emile by Hardy and the connection of Emile and Elizabeth by this animal magnetism. For example, when Elizabeth reaches out to the sunlight through the bars in the carriage, only for this to be echoed by Emile in his locked prison of a room. This, dear viewer, is all you need to know to possibly understand the film better, as, if you're like me, you will wonder what the fuck it's all about. The two performances that shone for me were the more understated. Yvonne Mitchell here is absolutely outstanding. What an actress. Her skill at playing the character of Aunt Hilda is exceptional. Look at her facial expressions. Such finesse of an actress of Mitchell's calibre. She really brings a mysterious complexity to the character, of which I wish I knew more of, and would have loved to have seen Mitchell have more screen time. She is fascinating, and is one of the best characters in the movie. The other, of course, has to be Shane Bryant as the sickly Emil. In his introductory role, he is just the right balance of neurosis and stability, which can oscillate between rational and irrational, solid and psychotic and through his makeup seems to ooze a sickness and personifies one of the primary feelings that the film is trying to convey in its fetid atmosphere. Peter Sykes comes up trumps with his claustrophobic oppressive ambience, especially filmed in the rooms of Castle Zorn. The mixture of sex and violence is also quite striking, especially full frontal in Virginia Wetherill's peasant in a dress shop sequence, and the ending, of course, is a violent bloodbath. The impalement of a burning crucifix right in the guts is taking the X certificate as far as a dead one. This is not your average Hammer film and is on the whole a cerebral affair. However, I found it totally absorbing and out of all the Hammer films I revisited, this had a different effect on me after watching it again. A very positive one, I must confidently add. Based on this film's brave daring, the experimental, cast performances, direction, unusual premise and sheer intrigue, and the fact I can overlook the plastic buttons on Emile's frilly orange number, I will give this 10 out of 10. I do like movies, though, what others would charmingly refer to as weird shit, so it may not be to everyone's cup of tea. It seems with Demons of the Mind, it wasn't only Mesmer who could hypnotise. As for me personally, Sykes does it here, to his audience, with his cracking direction, which at times holds you spellbound. With iron, and with fire, and with the Lord's protection, we can slaughter our enemy! Come on, let's get sworn! He's a demon! Come on! Liverpool, 1972, and Brenda is a disturbed young woman with a penchant for fairy stories and make-believe. She tells her mother fibs, saying she is pregnant. Brenda makes the decision that by moving to London, she hopes she will find her phantom baby, a father. Arriving at Earl's Court in London, Brenda gets digs and works at a trendy London boutique. 
Brenda works with the stunning Caroline and they strike up an unlikely friendship. Caroline invites Brenda to a party she's organised to introduce her to more people, bring her out of her shell and maybe find a boyfriend. However, when Brenda finds Caroline in bed with Joey, a guy she fancies, she flees into the concrete arms of the Capitol. Walking alone in a sorry state, Brenda finds a dog called Tinker and takes the dog back to her digs. Brenda is unaware she has been spotted by Peter. Bathing the dog and cleaning Tinker up, she plucks up the courage to take him back to Peter. Peter is suspicious of her and demands to know why she is giving the pet back after believing Brenda stole it. Brenda is upset, but they strike up a relationship where they both begin to form a bubble of make-believe. Peter asks Brenda to move in with him. It isn't long before Brenda finds her Prince Charming has a nasty past, where beauty needs to be destroyed and the act of psychotic annihilation replaces it. Peter Collinson, who went behind the lens for this film, was already an established director, and a good one at that. By the time he went behind the lens for Straight On Till Morning, his previous triumphs were a 1967's home invasion movie, The Penthouse, kitchen sink melodramas, and the superb cinematic adaptation of the uh, play Up the Junction from the BBC play for Today Strand. Collinson cemented his artistry in uh, 1969's The Italian Job, and in 1971 had a dry run of psychodramas with the giallo-esque Fright from Fantau Films, the people behind the Karnstein trilogy for Hammer. The film was in fact made for its female lead, the unconventional beauty, elfin-like Rita Tushingham. Tushingham was approached by playwright John Peacock, known for his portfolio of horror and thriller screenplays for TV, to appear in a vehicle directed by Collinson in a role slightly unorthodox for the actress. Tushingham was an actress usually saddled with offbeat, kooky roles which were quintessentially 60s. Take, for example, the film The Knack and How to Get It with Michael Crawford. Ray! Not today, thank you. Films such as Smashing Time with Lynn Redgrave and The Guru from 1969 with Michael York. And then touching them in the awesome A Taste of Honey and the brave film The Leather Boys in 1964, which looked at homosexuality. Unfortunately, Tushingham was saddled with the ugly duckling role as an antithesis to the glamour pusses that permeated the films of the 60s and at the start of her career, and because she doesn't have the dolly bird finesse wanted at the time, is usually shoehorned into the frumpy roles or playing characters where she was the object of slapstick and mishaps being the butt of the joke. So appearing in Straight On Till Morning was jarring, as finally here we get to see the superb actress Tushingham is. It's as though Tushingham's frustration of typecast are highlighted in the plot, except when she becomes a butterfly to please her man, her fragile wings are brutally cut. The title of the movie, Straight Onto a Morning, originates from the 1904 Peter Pan novel, and in the book, the directions lead to Neverland. However, in this film, those directions are for highly sinister reasons. Straight On Until Morning also predates Peter Pan Syndrome, a genuine psychological condition that wasn't coined by the psychology profession until about 1983. The characteristics of Peter Pan Syndrome, that of a carefree attitude, low emotional maturity and emotional intelligence, and spontaneous or impulsive behaviour, is clearly evident in Brian's excellently portrayed character before it became a psychological condition. Rita Tushingham is an odd match for Bryant, but it is the strong bond from this Peter Pan syndrome to her Wendy complex that makes them gel. The Wendy complex, another psychological condition where such people are tormented by conflicting feelings that reflect their self-doubt in the way they feel about the prospect of being rejected, results in spending their time and effort providing comfort and security for other people. This is an exchange for thanks and similar displays of affection. These psychological aberrations are the cement that strengthens the bond between them. 
Straight On Till Morning and its companion piece Fear in the Night were released as a double bill called Women in Terror in the summer of 72, as Michael Carreras, now managing director of Hammer, uh, but unaware of the studio's debts, wanted a new spin on some of the studio's formulaic output, an idea that had fascinated the studio, borderline obsession, since the beginning of the decade. The film was shot at Elstree and surrounding London locations. One noteworthy locale is the South Bank Centre, London, England, for perfect retro-futurist appeal, and it was all recorded at the end of 1971, and the movie itself was eventually completed in the spring of 72. When producers Anglo EMI viewed it, they contemplated it would generate a lot of money at the box office and had a belief that it was going to be a success. To their anger, it wasn't. This proved a revisit to the tried and tested double bill was also now old fashioned and decidedly not on trend anymore. And again and again and again and again we look onto the States again for their release on the Shout Factory label for this film. Their high definition release of Straight On Till Morning ensures we get to hear the memoirs of those involved where Rita Tushingham discusses this film with film historian Jonathan Sothcott. And it's fascinating stuff, it is too. Another exceptional entry from Hammer Films. A contemporary snapshot, although as in Dracula AD 1972, rather dated, of London at the time. Some find Collinson's avant-garde non-linear intercutting rather jarring, but this I found suitable to reflect the fractured and twisted narrative of this gem of a movie. Highlights were definitely where Peter narrates uh, fairy tales, providing an opportunity for Collinson to intercut it with the warped truth. Straight onto a morning shakes off the hammer ambience entirely, and if one had missed the opening intro, which shows it's a hammer production, one would be forgiven in thinking this was a European slice of avant garde sleaze from another production company entirely. Straight on supports superb performances, especially Shane Bryant, whom here is just as sleazy a character as the guy in Peeping Tom, except here the screams and cries of death are on a soundtrack. A symphony of sadism, which is utilised instead of visual snuff. Tushingham also gives us a stunning performance, and her hysterics at the end of the movie are genuinely convincing. Right away, you can't help feel sorry for the woman who aims to please, only for it to be her ultimate downfall. Though the ending leaves an ambiguity, which I kind of like. Finally, a supporting cast of Tom Bell, James Bolam, the beautiful Katia Wyeth, and Claire Kelly as uh, Tushingham's neurotic mother and jazz singer, also Annie Ross, who supplies the earworm of the theme, just rounds off this bleak journey of a psycho in Squatterland. Despite its fairy tale ambience, straight on till morning is pure nihilism, and some of it remains disturbingly brutal. Just like Demons of the Mind, this is also another underappreciated gem, and one I have only got round to viewing. Why I'd never seen it before, despite knowing it's existent, God only knows. Straight on till morning gets to the top of the stairs and gets a 9 out of 10 from me. Once upon a time, long before you and I were born, there was a wondrous magic garden. Our story starts here in Liverpool, in this house, with this girl. The princess, Rosalba. But this is no fairy tale, as you will see. I just want a baby, that's all. And so the girl who dreamed of magic gardens, castles and princes came to the big city to be with the beautiful people. A wide-eyed innocent searching for love. Look, you want to get a fellow, don't you? Well, stop worrying and let them come to you. And all of a sudden, she found her prince and fell in love at first sight of him. Why me? Why did you want to talk to me? Why? Why? I just want a baby, that's all. A 
love story from Hammer that makes the heart beat faster and faster yet. Which is your room? You go up these stairs, you take the first car on the right, and go straight on till morning. Straight. else was he? He knew many kinds of women. But beauty for this man was an ugly sin, an obscenity to be destroyed. Beauty was for killing. Killing. Why, Wendy? Just pretty for you. A love story from Hammer that takes you straight on and into a strange world of extraordinary pathos. I do not want you to go out. Well, that's all for 1972, and in our next episode of our Hammathon, we reach the end after all this time, and so, dear viewer, the last hurrah, as Captain Kronos slays the pointy-toothed and becomes a comic book hero, Frankenstein creates the monster from hell and gets his teeth into it, where vampires from the Orient become golden and kick ass. And Christopher Lee offers the devil a daughter and nurses a freaky fetus in the process. All this and more in the next must-see instalment of Look, Look and Look Again. Join me then, won't you? Until next time, cheerio.